one of the one of the difficulties when you when you moderate an event like this is to find a way to introduce uh, the, the guest in, in, in a way that surprises people. Um, it's hard to do with Imran Khan, uh, particularly for this audience. I, I, I suspect he needs no introduction at all. So I, I'll start Imran by asking you to explain that and, and what what constellation of events have taken place that lead you to that conclusion. Well, thank you, Bobby, uh, uh, for the introduction. Very briefly, uh, you know, about the book, I just want to, before I answer that question, the book is written for two reasons. One, it is written um, for the youth of Pakistan, because never in my, my life, which almost, uh, I was, uh, Pakistan was five years old when I was born. So never in, in my life have I seen the Pakistani youth more confused as it is right now. So there's so many questions, so many issues, um, issues about secularism, about Islam, about Pakistan's future, about politics, about international relations, about war on terror. So I thought, um, you know, there needs to be a direction that what are the problems, what are the solutions. The second was for, um, as someone who has spent so much time uh, in the Western world and who understands, I believe I understand the Western mind. And in the war on, this war on terror, the confusion in the West about Islam as if this war has something to do with an ideology, rather than that this is the roots are all political. Uh, so I thought it was important also to explain to the, uh, to people here what, what Islam is, what is, what is this whole war on terror and what are the solutions. Now coming back to um, you know what you just the question you asked me, um, I 15 years of politics. No one has done politics like um, my party has done. To be in the opposition in in, in, in in Pakistani politics, in which there was eight eight years of military dictator, is the hardest thing if you compare politics to the Western world. And then to survive in these 15 years, staying in opposition and surviving. And then emerging suddenly in all the opinion polls as the most popular party in Pakistan today. Now, the reason why I say that I finally feel um, that the opponents are on the mat and that they will not now be able to get up, because I feel that the, the young people in Pakistan, the youth of Pakistan, has already decided. It's not that it's deciding, it has already decided that it wants to change. And they have already decided that the party for change is that it can suffer. And I, as someone who, who have probably the only politician who's moving around in Pakistan, because as you know, most of the other politicians are now bunkered in, they can't get out because of the fear of, of uh, fear which this war on terror has, uh, uh, the message it has sent to all politicians, petrified of being bombed. So as someone who has now been in the public for these past three years, and specifically in the last year, I already see this change. And I see nothing in Pakistan, none of these political parties can now stop this process of change. This is, uh, this is the young people of this country, which are 70% of Pakistanis are below the age of 30. 70% below the age of 30. And if you go in Pakistan today to universities, colleges, schools, already they have made up their mind. And that's where my optimism stems from, because I now know that the old political parties do not have any cards left. There's nothing they can do to reverse this. The only way they can reverse this, this big tsunami that is going to sweep Pakistan is by performing. But they're all in power now. And one thing Asr Zadari, the biggest favor he has done to us, Pakistanis, is that he's exposed all the political forces in the country. He's basically bought all of them. He, he, um, he started from the premise that all politicians have a price, or all crooked politicians have a price, and he co-opted all of them. And so as the, as the country and the economy sinks, so have all the political parties sunk with him. He's taken them down with him. 
And the only party that has, is now, if you look at the polls, the only party which is going up is Tariq and Saf. All the other parties are going, going down. And as I said, the only way they can reverse this is by suddenly performing. But I'm afraid there, there is a total institutional collapse in Pakistan. There's nothing they can do now to stop this, this process of change. And finally, what has really sparked off this process of change is the most vibrant, independent media, specifically television. Television has changed Pakistan. The level of political awareness is Pakistan, in Pakistan is unprecedented. The most popular programs are current affair programs. So every evening, there are about six current affair programs that are constantly informing the public about the situation and about the politics and the politicians. And so therefore, in my opinion, the next elections where you will see a bigger change. Then there was a, there was a big wave in 1970 by Zulfiqar Ali I see a bigger change coming in the, in the coming elections next year. You pointed out that 70% of the Palestinian young people, uh, young people um, and they, they face uh, a great deal of misrule, corruption, um, lack of jobs, inflation. These are all factors that have combined in other parts of the world this year to create revolution. You know, spring um, uprisings in, in Europe, and now here in the United States. Why has there not been a Pakistani spring? You see, there was already a Pakistani uh, equivalent to the Arab Spring actually happened, what was then called the Lois Movement. That was our Arab Spring. Uh, unfortunately, that was hijacked. As you will see these Middle Eastern uh, revolutions being hijacked, there's counter, there's counter revolution already taking place in some of the countries. Ours was, uh, you know, uh, as we were moving towards uh, a genuine democracy, unfortunately we were hijacked by one of the political parties. They joined us and then, they, then all of us ended up boycotting the elections, saying that these elections were, were managed, there were people rigging in that, the Chief Justice was in a house arrest. How could you have an election when the media was muzzled, politi uh, political party workers were in jails, uh, and unfortunately, at the last minute, PMLN ended up going into the elections and destroyed this movement. Then again, this movement started behind the Chief Justice in what was called the Long March, which was, again, the whole public joined in. And again, uh, this polit uh, political party did a deal and came back halfway through from Islamabad, and again, the whole movement collapsed. But this time, uh, this time, I'm afraid, uh, as the political party itself has got exposed, now what you will see uh, that unlike the Middle East, we are probably a country which actually has now a political party to lead this. In the Middle East, the problem is this is it's all it's a civil society coming out, but there's no clear leadership. In Pakistan today, Tariq and Saf has given that leadership, so for, which stands for a movement for change. So we are actually ahead of the Middle East. Secondly, our media is way ahead of the Middle East. In the Middle East, it was the social media that, was, that is what created awareness. In Pakistan, we actually have a very vibrant print and, and, and television, uh, electronic media, which is uh, constantly uh, uh, informing the public about what's happening. When I, when I last met you, it was in Washington two years ago, um, you were already expressing quite a lot of alarm about the nature of American-Pakistani relations. And, and you were concerned that American policy uh, executed in Afghanistan and in Pakistan was putting an enormous strain on Pakistan, but also sort of threatening the, the core of this relationship. And now from reading your book, I get the impression, if I'm reading it right, that you feel that that has come to pass, that the damage is now quite substantial. Maybe you're a terrorist. Am I reading that right? Well, look, you know, I. I opposed this war on terror from day one because you know it, it 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 was as if the Bush administration had decided that they were fighting some conventional war. A war on terror is it, it, you know you win the war when you win the people over to your side. It's essentially a war of 
winning the hearts and minds of people and isolating the terrorists. Now, this nightmare which unfolded in Afghanistan and Pakistan was clearly losing, it was all for losing hearts and minds. So they were never going to be, they, they were never going to win, win this war. It was so obvious to anyone who was watching. Now just to, the reason why I, from day one I opposed this war is because I'm probably the only Pakistani who has traveled all over the tribal areas. I did it 20 years ago, I wrote a, a, a travel book called The Warrior Race. And, and throughout the tri tribal agencies I, I've been there. And, uh, and in this book I had written that this was the ultimate warrior, warrior race in the sense that every man is a warrior. Because I have, you know, my passion apart from cricket used to be shooting. And because they knew I, uh, I would shoot, everywhere I went I was challenged for, to shooting matches in the tribal area. And 14 year old boys would be able to shoot, you know, uh, as well as, 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 as anyone. So here was a, and I'm talking now specifically of the tribal areas of Pakistan. Now, there are about a million armed men in our tribal areas. Million armed men. Now, it was so obvious that if some Al-Qaeda had come from Tora Bora into Pakistan, clearly the way to win this war was to use these million armed men who had always stood by Pakistan to isolate the terrorists. And in the beginning, 240 Al-Qaeda were handed over to the Pakistan army by the tribal people, the tribals. But what General Musharraf did was, for me, the biggest blunder in Pakistan, under American pressure. Americans knew nothing about the tribal areas. But at least the Pakistan government should have. Under American pressure, in 2004, they sent the Pakistan army into the tribal areas. And what they did was, the most insane and immoral way of fighting a war on terror is they started bombing villages with artillery, with helicopter gunships, with F-16s. Two years of this insane collateral damage created the Pakistan Taliban. We did not have any militant Taliban in Pakistan. In fact, this, uh, this collateral damage through military operations, killing women and children, turned these people, rather than winning them over to our side, we actually began to push them over to the other side. And so what has the Pakistan Taliban? Basically our own tribal people. And behind this war was a web of deceit and lies. Every war is, you know, and truth is the first casualty. But in this particular war, trying to make your own people swallow that they were actually killing their own people, they kept each time insisting that there were foreign militants they were killing. And they were actually killing their own people. And, and this collateral damage is what created now what today is the Pakistani Taliban. They, where there was no Taliban in Pakistan, militant Taliban, there are 30 militant Taliban groups operating in Pakistan. And we are not winning the war. The army is stuck. 140,000 Pakistani soldiers are stuck in the tribal area. And similarly, exactly the same thing happened on the other side of the border, the US. Rather, rather than isolating Al-Qaeda, they ended up pushing Taliban towards Al-Qaeda. And then Taliban ceased to become Taliban because as has always happened in Afghanistan, when a foreign uh, invader comes, sooner or later the whole of uh, uh, the, uh, the people of Afghanistan get together against any foreign invader. This is their history. So inevitably that was going to happen in Afghanistan. So the US is stuck in Afghanistan, Pakistani army is stuck in our tribal areas. And guess who's the beneficiary? The real terrorists. So they have benefited from this war. So we are actually, rather than winning the war, we're actually helping the terrorists. So the solution does not lie in more military action or military operations. The solution lies in a political settlement in winning the people of tribal areas to your side and isolating the terrorists. It's still the same solution. And, and, and talk a little more about what that has done for U.S.-Pakistan relations and whether and what it will take now to mend the damage in those relations. Well, I think that there, you know, all, there was an all parties conference in Islamabad recently after this uh, uh, Admiral Mullen statement, and the all parties conference came up. I thought with a very uh, uh, with a constructive statement, and I am very proud to say that our party was the architect of it to give peace a chance 
So uh, the all parties conference said that it's time now to start holding dialogue. Uh, on, and uh, rather than Pakistan army going after the Haqqani network, uh, and Haqqani network, by the way, you're talking about 5,000 fighters. Now the impression being given here to the American public is that the U.S. cannot win in, in Afghanistan. 140,000 soldiers cannot win because of 5,000 uh, Rambos rolled up in, uh, in North Waziristan. <laughs> this is clearly, it's just insane to think that this is, you know, this is the reason why they're not winning. Um, uh, in my opinion, rather than asking the Pakistan army to go against these, uh, the Haqqani network, Pakistan army should use its influence, if it has any influence, to ask them, because Haqqani network is part of the Taliban. Haqqani acknowledges Mullah Omar as his leader. So therefore, they should use that influence in getting them uh, to the dialogue table. Because uh, clearly now, the US has also realized that the answer does not lie in more military actions, but it lies in, um, uh, in, in, getting, uh, in, in the political process. So rather than Pakistan army going there, I think Pakistan could play a much more constructive role if the army then goes and um, and um, <coughs> and helps in this dialogue in a political setting. Was Malin wrong, by the way? I, how can I, I again repeat? How can it? The no, no. Whether whether or not the, the Akani network is is sort of single-handedly bringing the American sort of presence to a standstill, was Malin right that the that the ISI uh, is working with the Akani network? You know, well, you know, I mean, I, not being privy to what ISI gets up to, but all I can say is that knowing uh, the Afghan mind, anyone who knows the Afghan mind, knows that the Afghan groups have never been controlled by anyone. Uh, you know that when initially after 9-11, Pakistan sent the ISI general, General Mahmood, went to Munaumar to convince him to hand over Osama bin Laden to the... Uh, to the Americans, but what was the answer? I mean, it's a fallacy to think that the Afghans have ever been controlled by anyone. Uh, their history says that whenever a, a puppet government has been put in Afghanistan, they've never accepted it. Neither have they accepted foreign interference. And certainly to think that Haqqani network is being controlled by the ISI so that it is going to uh, do such daring acts as, as attack uh, you know, the American embassy, I have my doubts about it. One more question for me, and then I know people are very anxious to, to get their questions in. Uh, from, from the north to the, to the east, there's so much of the Pakistani military's self-justification, um, and this is also true of many Pakistani political parties, is predicated on the idea that Pakistan has this historical rivalry with India, enmity with India, and that India represents an existential threat to Pakistan, and that's why the military needs to continue to consume 60% of the budget. That's why uh, there needs to be um, that many soldiers and that much money spent on the army. Do you, as a, as a potential leader of Pakistan, do you think Pakistan, that India represents an existential threat to Pakistan? No, the answer is no, I don't think so. But I think in the military psyche, because of the three wars fought between Pakistan and India, uh, you know, it's just in their genes that there's a the threat is from, from India. And, and being a smaller country, always, you know, the threat is exaggerated. And as a result, of course, the army has played a disproportionate role in Pakistan because of this, this uh, perceived threat from India. But I think that, you know, time has possibly come for um, Pakistan and India to, to have a completely new relationship. Because, you know, the two... The, the relationship is based on suspicion. The relationship between the two countries is completely counterproductive for both the countries. India needs Pakistan, Pakistan needs India. India needs Pakistan because uh, India is uh, aspiring to be a global economic power. It, has, it is an energy deficit country. And Pakistan is on the way where all the it's where the energy corridor is from. So, in my opinion, um, this distrust has to go. 
Because no matter what, how much confidence building measures you have, unless and until we come to an understanding that our intelligence agencies will not interfere with each other, or will no longer play a part in, in, in any violence in, in, in each other's countries, uh, I'm afraid no matter how far we go with confidence building measures, one act like Mumbai will be back to square one. And therefore, uh, a new relationship has to, has to develop between the two countries. And Kashmir clearly is uh, a bone of contention, but other countries have such issues too, and I think it should be settled on the negotiating table. Uh, uh, rather than as this policy of um, you know, Pakistan promoting militancy, it's become counterproductive for Pakistan. And I think a new relationship based on trust uh, will benefit the subcontinent.